So this is writing an interpreter in SQL for fun and no profit. So the first question you may have is, why in the world would you want to do this? And since you're all at Bing Bing Con, you probably know that the answer is because it's fun. So let's get started. The first thing we need to decide is what our language will look like. And Lisp is a really great place to start. It's very easy to write a Lisp interpreter. This is actually a full Lisp interpreter that was uh, made by Paul Graham. And so uh, our first step, uh, we need to write a Lisp parser in SQL. But instead of doing that, uh, we can uh, just use JSON, where Postgres has extremely good JSON support. Here are like, a few common operations you can do. You can easily construct JSON arrays or JSON objects and index into JSON arrays and objects. Uh, and it's pretty easy to map Lisp code to JSON, where you can represent Lisp code as arrays of JSON. So we're halfway done. We have our parser. Uh, all, <laughs> all that's left to do is implement our backend. So uh, we can try taking another Lisp interpreter and convert it into SQL, but this isn't the easiest to do. Where general purpose programming language features don't really map that well to SQL. So how about we start by, t uh, by doing something a bit simpler than writing a full interpreter? We'll start with a basic calculator. So we'll try to support the basic arithmetic operations and the ability to nest these operations. And so to evaluate an expression in our calculator, we'll say that the arithmetic operators and numbers will evaluate to themselves. And then to evaluate uh, a compound expression, we'll first recursively evaluate each argument and then apply that, uh, the given operator to those arguments. As an example, we can try evaluating a more complex expression that's like this. Uh, so the first thing we do is recursively evaluate each argument, and that gives us plus, six, and 10. And then when we, when we apply, six, or apply plus to six and 10, we get 16 as the result of this expression. Now, one problem with this is that SQL doesn't have recursion, so it's not the easiest uh, to express this. But as we learned earlier, uh, you can do recursion with a stack instead, where anything you can do with recursion, you can do with a loop and stack. So for our stack, each entry in the stack will maintain our state uh, for one expression as we uh, iteratively evaluate the arguments one at a time. Uh, so to implement this in SQL, we'll use two different uh, features of SQL. We'll use case statements and recursive CTEs. Uh, case is analogous to if else in any other programming language, where you say if this is true, return this, otherwise if this is true, return that, and so on. And then recursive CTEs are a way that you can emulate loops in SQL. For recursive CTE, you give Postgres an initial query and a recursive query. Postgres will first run the initial query uh, and take the results of that and feed that into the recursive query, and then take the results of the recursive query and feed that back into the recursive query and keep doing that indefinitely. Uh, as an example, we can use this to implement a counter. So for our initial query, we do select one, which gives us the value one. And then for our recursive query, we select i plus one. So this will give us two, three, four, five, and so on. And this would continue indefinitely, but we're only asking for the first five values. So Postgres will evaluate this lazily, calculate the first five values, one through five, return those, and then terminate. So we get the, uh, first, the numbers one through five. Uh, so let's look at how our interpreter may work. We can make, use a JSON object to represent the entire program state, which will be a uh, pair of values, a stacked, which we talked about before, which will keep track of our state as we recursively evaluate expressions, and a result value, which we'll use uh, to pass values between uh, different stack frames. So our recursive CTE will repeatedly iterate and look at the top stack frame and do some computation associated with it. It may push on new stack frames or pop stack frames off. And here are a few basic ways that we can manipulate the stack. It's pretty easy to like create a new state. Uh, we can push frames onto the stack and we can pop them off. And so for our initial interpreter, we'll have three different kinds of stack frames. We'll have an expression stack frame which will take a given expression, evaluate it, and return the corresponding value. We'll have an eval arg stack frame, which will uh, give in a list of expressions to evaluate, evaluate them one at a time, uh, and keep track of our progress as we do that. And a eval call stack frame, which will take a list of evaluated arguments and apply uh, the given operator to those arguments. So here's a skeleton of what our interpreter will look like. It's a recursive CTE, and for our initial query, we'll have an initial state that's a single expression stack frame with the program we want to run. And in this case, the program you want to run is multiply five by six and then add seven, so the answer is 37, a pretty straightforward program. As for our recursive query, the first thing we'll do is alias a whole bunch of values. Uh, so we'll say things like the type of the first stack frame, we'll just call that frame type, and this will make the rest of the code in our interpreter a lot easier. All the actual logic will be done in this case statement here, where we'll do a whole bunch of different 
uh, branches against the current state and return a new resulting state based on the current state. So we need to handle a whole bunch of different cases. The first case is expression stack frames, and there are two different cases here. One is self-evaluating expressions. So if the type of the expression is either a number or string, we'll set the result to the expression itself, since the expression is self-evaluating. As for uh, function calls, so the, to evaluate a function call, we need to first recursively evaluate each argument. And to do that, we will push, push an eval args uh, frame onto the stack with the list of arguments to evaluate. Uh, so now, second kind of frame we need to handle are eval args frames. And there's a few different cases here. Uh, first, there's the base case where if the uh, list of arguments left to evaluate is empty, we will push an eval call frame onto the stack with the arguments we've already evaluated. Now for the recursive case, we need to handle when there are still arguments left. And to do this, we'll take the first argument from the list, uh, remove it from the list, and then push on an expression stack frame onto the stack to evaluate it. And once we get the result back from that evaluation, we will add that argument to the done array. So this uh, eval arg stack frame will evaluate all the arguments and then push an eval call frame onto the stack with the evaluated arguments. Now the last thing we need to handle is the actual uh, call evaluation. And this is pretty straightforward. We look at the operator and apply the given operator to the arguments. So if the operator is plus, we'll sum the two arguments and similar for the other kinds of operators. Uh, last thing we need is when to terminate the interpreter. And this is pretty straightforward. We can terminate once the stack is empty. Uh, and so we get a full query, looks something like this. Uh, and there's our little program at the top uh, of it. Uh, and so if you run that query, you get uh, 37. Which will, uh, so. <laughs> so math does indeed work. Uh, so now that we have our basic calculator, uh, we can start thinking about what features we need to add to get our language uh, to a general purpose, or like to a Turing complete language. And once we have these features, we can start writing some real programs. For example, here's a program that will generate the first 10 Fibonacci numbers. Uh, so let's go through those features and add them one at a time. So first thing, comparison operators greater than, less than, and equal to. Uh, we can add these in the exact same way as we added the other arithmetic operators. Uh, list operations, we can represent lists under the hood as arrays, and then we can add things like head, which will return the first element of the array, tail, which will delete the first element from the array, cons, which will add a new element to the front of the array, and empty, which will return the empty list. So th these are everything, everything we need to start working with list, lists in our language. Uh, if statements, to implement if statements, if a expression starts with if, uh, we will push an eval if stack frame onto the stack. And then to evaluate an eval if stack frame, we will first evaluate the predicate of the if branch. If the predicate winds up being true, we will uh, evaluate the then branch of the if statement. Uh, otherwise, we'll evaluate the else branch of the if statement. And that's what this code uh, does here. Uh, now, the last thing we need to add are lambda functions. And this is a bit more involved. Uh, so we need to, uh, in order to have functions, like we need to add some support for variables. We also need to be able to actually create functions and define what happens when you call a function. So in order to add variables, the first thing we need to do is introduce a concept of environments, where an environment is a list of all the variables that currently exist and associated values with them, which we can represent as a JSON object. Uh, there's a whole bunch of code needed to actually pass around the current environment, but uh, I'm gonna admit that it's not too interesting. The main thing you need to know is that the only place where an environment actually changes is when you uh, call a function. Uh, so, because that's the only place where you can create variables right now. And then to actually evaluate a variable, uh, we will look up that variable in the current environment, where environments are just a JSON dictionary of the variables to their values. Uh, so to define a lambda function, we'll use the same syntax as every other language. And then if an expression starts with lambda, we will return a function object, which is the information needed to actually run that function. And that is the arguments of the, the lambda function and the uh, body of the function. Then when you call a function, uh, we, the way you evaluate the function is you evaluate the body of it by pushing an expression stack frame onto the stack to evaluate the body of the function. And then to evaluate, and then we give as the environment, uh, the existing environment when the function was created, along with new entries based on the arguments passed into the function. So we say that the name of the first argument of the function is assigned to the first value that was actually passed in. The name of the second argument 
is assigned to the second value passed in, and so on. And so going to our Fibonacci example, uh, we can actually now run this program. Uh, one thing is that it's not, the straight, it's not super straightforward to do recursion, where uh, lambda functions don't have the ability to refer to themselves, but we can use this clever trick where we have a function take in a copy of itself, and then we add this little bit of extra code that'll take that function and pass in a copy of itself to itself. And since that function can now refer to itself, it's able to call itself and do recursion. Uh, all the actual logic is here. So the way we'll do the first 10 Fibonacci numbers is we'll keep track of the current Fibonacci number and the next Fibonacci number, and we'll have a counter go from zero to 10. So if we hit the base case, which is when our counter hits 10, we'll return the empty list. Otherwise, we will add the current Fibonacci number onto the result of recursing with the next Fibonacci number and the next next Fibonacci number, and then we increment our counter. Uh, and this will give us uh, the first 10 Fibonacci numbers. So our full code looks something like this. Uh, it's 100 lines of code, uh, which like for programming language is actually pretty good, to be honest. Uh, and uh, when we run it, we get the first 10 Fibonacci numbers. So, so if you ever find yourself wanting to embed a programming language in SQL, uh, this is one way you could go about it. Uh, you probably really shouldn't, though. Um, one additional thing is I'm currently working on a side business called Perfolytics to help companies uh, optimize Postgres. Uh, I have a Postgres extension which will collect information about your queries as they run, and then I can give you specific advice based on that information on how you can go about optimizing those queries. So if you uh, are on a team that's having trouble scaling Postgres, and your team doesn't have the in-house expertise on how to go about that, uh, I'd be really interested in talking to you. So you can either come up to me after the talk or email me at michael at uh, That's it. <laughs>